Coming up on Market to Market. Looming drought snags the attention of farmers. A familiar face is slated to take the helm at USDA. And market analysis with Naomi Bloom and Matthew Bennett, next. What's the most complex industry on Earth? It's not genetics, or meteorology, or logistics. It's a business that involves them all. It's farming. Thank you, farmers, from Pioneer. Tomorrow, for over 100 years, we've worked to help our customers be ready for tomorrow. Trust in tomorrow. Information is available from a Grinnell Mutual agent today. This is the Friday, December 11 edition of Market to Market, the weekly journal of rural America. Hello, I'm Paul Yeager. With consumers holding so much sway in the U.S. economy, each government report on spending, prices, or employment carries weight. The amount consumers paid in November edged up two-tenths of a percent as lower food prices were offset by a gain in the cost of electricity and natural gas. When the volatile energy sector is removed, the rate for core CPI stayed the same at two-tenths of a percent. Inflation appears muted in the measures of pressures before they reach the consumer. The producer price index squeezed out a tenth of a percent gain. Less energy was needed to heat homes last month as the entire planet just recorded its hottest November. The European Union's Copernicus Climate Change Service reported the mark even as a La Nina event is affecting weather across the globe. This is the opposite of traditional temperature records that come with La Nina. Normally, hotter temperatures are associated with an El Nino event. Peter Tubbs reports on the weather system's impact on North America. The specter of drought is haunting much of the United States as 2020 draws to a close. 45% of the continental U.S. is experiencing some degree of drought, and meteorologists expect much of the country could see their conditions worsen in early 2021. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's Climate Prediction Center sees a La Nina as well established, increasing the probability the winter of 2020 will be cooler and wetter in the north and warmer and drier in the south. The combination would set up the western half of the U.S. for severe drought conditions, adding to production challenges and an already difficult economic climate for agriculture in the region. So unfortunately, that boats badly for the southwestern United States and will probably expand or develop drought across the southern tier of states, even though it's been pretty wet in the southeast with all the tropical systems that have made landfall. The winter wheat crop faces immediate challenges. Limited subsoil moisture, combined with a lack of snow cover, may limit yield potential in the spring. Western reservoirs, which received some replenishment during the relatively wet years of 2017 and 2018, may be headed downward as precipitation goes elsewhere. Last couple of months, this is supposed to be the rainy season for the far west, and really only the extreme Pacific Northwest has gotten any kind of decent precipitation so far this winter. The current La Nina formed in September and typically influences weather patterns for five to nine months, although some La Ninas have endured for years. The Climate Forecasting Center issues its next three-month outlook on December 17th. From Market to Market, I'm Peter Tubbs. If Tom Vilsack is confirmed as Secretary of Agriculture, his second week back on the job would make him the longest-serving secretary behind James Wilson, whose tenure ended in 1913. The USDA of today is much different than it was for Wilson, and Mr. Vilsack is about to see how his view on the rural American landscape may have changed since he left the department in 2017. John Torpy has the story. I would say that we're also deeply concerned about recent... This week, former USDA Secretary where, uh, Tom Vilsack was asked by President-elect Joe Biden to reprise the role of leading the U.S. Department of Agriculture. See, we've made some significant progress. The former the two-term Iowa so governor, who held the job for eight years during the Obama administration, was part of a short list of candidates which included Representative Marsha Fudge of Ohio, who is viewed by many as an advocate for food assistance programs, including SNAP. 
Representative Fudge has been tapped to lead the Department of Housing and Urban Development. The National Farmers Union noted Secretary Vilsack's previous experience will help him in the role and added more work needs to be done to help protect family farms and expansion of nutrition assistance programs. The Iowa Renewable Fuels Association applauded the appointment and noted Vilsack understands challenges facing the biofuels industry. Vilsack, no stranger to the issues the office currently faces, will have to consider a diverse set of issues including food insecurity, climate change, carbon sequestration, and resolution of charges against USDA over discrimination by some black farmers. For Market to Market, I'm John Torpy. Next, the Market to Market Report. Grain markets were mixed overnight as traders continue to adjust to yesterday's USDA numbers. In light of the report, many are focusing on South American weather, demand headlines, and the holidays. March wheat skyrocketed the last two days of trade to finish higher for the week by 39 cents, while the nearby corn contract added 3 cents. The, no, the weather report took the wind from the January soybean sales, resulting in a 3 cent loss. January soybean meal declined 520 per ton. March cotton expanded 253 per hundredweight. In the dairy parlor, January class 3 milk futures improved 59 cents. A mixed week in the livestock sector. February cattle gained 85 cents. January feeders weakened a nickel. And the February lean hog contract fell 335. In the currency markets, the U.S. dollar index gained 24 ticks. January crude oil improved 57 cents per barrel. Comex gold gained $3 per ounce. And the Goldman Sachs commodity index increased more than two points to finish at 391.50. Now here to provide insight are two of our regular market analysts, Naomi Bloom and Matthew Bennett. Hello to the two of you. Hello. All right, Naomi, I'm going to give you the first crack here at giving me your best tweet of the report. So this means keep it short. And what were the headlines of Thursday's USDA report? Headlines were that the corn market for the report was just as it was expected. There were no big changes at all anywhere on the balance sheet. So that was expected and the market responded just neutral. For the soybean market, they were looking for a more bullish report, uh, looking for ending stocks to come in at 169, but instead they came in at 175 million bushels, which is still down from the month prior, but just not quite as much lower as what uh, market participants were hoping for. And then with the wheat market, that's the one that stole the show. Lower ending stocks, much more than expected. So that's what gave the wheat market a little bit of a lift this week. Matt, do you have a different uh, set of headlines or is that how you saw the report? No, that's how I saw the report. Essentially, I think that your bulls were a little disappointed that maybe exports didn't go up for either corn or beans. Yeah, you know, uh, kind of a blase report, but typically you see a blase report in the month of December. I think it's just a lot of folks after November's fireworks wondered if maybe we'd get some excitement out of December as well. We didn't, which I think, uh, you know, was, was as expected, I, I guess, for me anyway. Is this wheat market stuck in a Brady Bunch moment? Instead of it being Marsha, 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 it's Russia, Russia, Russia. Is there something else going on? <laughs> I think with the wheat market, uh, I think with the wheat market, I mean, essentially, I'm sorry, Paul. It's, it's showing Naomi right now. Is this right? Yeah, you're on. I see you. I hear you. Okay. We can switch can... back and forth. It's the way you watch okay. it. It's the power of technology. And I okay. know my Brady Bunch comment through you. So that's what I know has gotten you off. But let's go back to Russia and, uh, and, and the wheat market, man. Okay. Okay. Well, you know, whenever whenever you look at the wheat market, I mean, essentially Russia is saying they're wanting to throw an export tax on. At the same time, this Russian crop gets downgraded a little bit. But I mean, USDA is at 84. Uh, I've seen some private estimates all the way down well under 75. And so, you know, how much wheat are the Russians going to put out there? It's not like a crop failure by any means, but the Russians have been throwing a lot of wheat on the world market the last few years. So uh, I think the wheat market is looking at a lot of different things. For instance, world carry might drop just a little bit. U.S. carry down at, you know, what, 850 right now. Some folks are saying it could get under 800 easily. You know, and whenever we are, you're producing uh, the kind of wheat that uh, over a 2 billion bushel crop, We've seen a lot of 50% stocks to use ratio, or you know, stocks to use ratios the last few years. I mean, you could be looking at something well below that, even though we're not going to run out of wheat anytime soon. It's just 
a much tighter situation than what we're accustomed to. Naomi, do you see China sniffing around the market as also an influencer? Maybe the weather dry in the plains and other producing areas? It's multi-factors. Building on what Matt said, you know, 22% of the Russian wheat crop is treated as poor because it's had poor germination because it's so dry there. And that's why they're trying to do the export tax. So they're trying to curb themselves back and, and limit what they're exporting. Chinese demand, I think, is strong and has the ability to get stronger because they're going to need the wheat as a feed substitute going forward. Even though China has half of the world's ending stocks of wheat, do they really? Much people think that maybe some of it is out of, out of quality or that in general, because of the additional hogs that they're going to have, there's going to be more demand. And when you look at the United States, I've been hearing from clients that they are very concerned about the wheat that they planted. It hasn't germinated and the soil conditions are quite dry. So wheat might have a future for higher prices down the road. And I'm also keeping an eye on spring wheat. I think it's undervalued. I think spring wheat acres um, are gonna be in jeopardy this spring because of the high price of soybeans. So I'm keeping an eye on the Minneapolis wheat also. Do you have a range on that Minneapolis contract? Well, right now we got up to about the 570 area for the nearby March. And so it got through a short-term resistance area today. So moving averages. If it can push a little higher, I think we can get closer to 580 at most $6. That would be pushing it. We need some news to really get it to happen. But it's got some good fundamental and technical charge support as well. All right, Matt, are you buy selling or holding wheat right now? Any of the contracts? You know, I guess in my opinion, the wheat market has shown a little bit of flair here, but the people that I'm talking to like the profit margins that they see. So uh, typically I look at it as a, a risk management, a hedging type situation. Whenever I get July, uh, you know, Chicago wheat above six bucks, I like Chicago wheat in that area. Is, am I going to sell it all? No, but if I was going to be uh, put on the spot, buyer or seller, I'd say I'd be selling wheat whenever I get safely above six, at least uh, on a percentage basis. Naomi, let's go to corn for a moment. Uh, you talk about the report was not bullish uh, for corn necessarily, and bulls need fresh news. Are the two tied together specifically in corn, or is that more of a factor in other contracts? Uh, well, with the corn market, the biggest things that I'm keeping an eye on continue to be exports and ethanol. We have export sales at about 67% of USDA projections, and the USDA thinks that we're going to be exporting about 2.6 billion bushels of corn, so that's significant. Uh, so I thought it was prudent and smart that they didn't raise exports on this report. I thought that was really good. And then, of course, ethanol demand. Uh, we've had ethanol inventories at about a 27-week high just because we haven't been traveling for Thanksgiving like normal. So that is of concern. So I thought the USDA did a good job of not making any changes on the report. But going forward, uh, 1.7 bush billion bushel carryout with as tight as the soybean carryout is, the market is well supported. $4 support continues to be great support for front month contracts. Deferred contracts, the December is staying over $4 futures also. I still like corn market. It has potential, but we need obviously news to get it to spur over the resistance points. Is there a number after the four that gets us a flashing sign? You know, you talk about $4 resistance. If we get below 410, do you start thinking about putting some sales in? Uh, right now for the front month contracts, there is really good support at the 410 area. And then of course, $4 below there. I think selling corn now at these higher values is just good marketing. It's good value. You just never know what could maybe come around and make prices turn lower. But at the same time, um, I would say that the $4 point is just definitely major, major support. Unless that breaks, I'm not overly concerned at this time, but I don't wanna be complacent mm -hmm. either because it's 2020 and I'm sure there's gonna be one black swan lurking somewhere. All right, Matt, you get to you get to take that answer. Is there a black swan coming in corn? No, you don't have to answer that one. But uh, do you see a black swan event as the, the biggest thing that could impact this market? Or is it some of the other factors that Naomi just laid out? Well, yeah, I mean, there's no doubt that 
there's always going to be something out there none of us are thinking about. And so with that being said, I think uh, just kind of going along with what Naomi said, you've got as a producer to understand what these prices mean for your bottom line as compared to where we were at, you know, before the rally started. And so we came into the month of August and I mean, it was just uh, uh, man, blase, frustrating. Producers were worried about whether we were going to pay the bills again this year, you know, and then uh, everything changed. Everything changed dramatically. And so, uh, you know, I guess for, from my vantage point, I can go along with the fact that the USDA stayed at a one seven. I'm maybe a little more in the camp that uh, it's going to get tighter from here, though. I think whenever you see China going up to 16 and a half, as far as how much corn they're going to import, that's probably going to go on up, I guess, from my vantage point. Whenever I look at world stocks, for instance, you know, they're still uh, accounting for a heck of a lot of corn in China. They put 50 million metric tons out on their government auctions. I don't think the people that bought that corn was just going to put it in their storage facility and let it sit. I don't know why it's not coming off the world ledger. I think it's a tighter situation uh, than what we're currently seeing both world and domestically. Does that mean we're going to rally through the roof? I'm not sure. That's a really good question. So as a producer, if you sell some corn and then you keep a long bias on a limited risk basis, I think that makes a ton of sense. Does it, Naomi? You're shaking your head up and down like you might think it does. Does it? I think it does because we've seen that um, anything can happen with marketing, with, with how prices move. So if you're moving grain, if you're making cash sales, the basis continues to improve for a lot of places. You do have the money flow. You are making better sales than you've been at. And again, the stars have to continue to align in order for prices to continue to just march higher. We do need bad weather in South America. We need it to stay dry here next spring and summer. We need China to keep buying and the dollar to stay low. So if you can make sure that all four of those things are going to happen, great. You know what the market's going to do. But the reality is make some cash sales if it is a good profitable point for you. And like Matt said, um, we are able to help you with re-ownership strategies if it looks like the market may be going higher and you can do fixed risk strategies and have some upside potential to capture it on paper. Naomi, you bring up a great point because I seem to remember uh, not that long ago listening to the analysts on this show say, if this happens, if this happens, if this happens. But I don't know if we can hit black or red twice in a year. That's a lot of ifs. So I think you've got good advice there about, you know, put some sales in the book. So, Matt, I'm going to flip to you now for a question when we move into soybeans. Is CONAB a bigger deal with what Brazil reported, uh, a bigger impact on soybeans than what, than what the WASD was yesterday? Which one had a bigger effect on that market? Oh, I don't know. I would say Conab probably had a bigger effect. I mean, whenever you look at WASDI, it seems like they trail uh, Conab a little bit. You know, I, I've got to think that USDA is a little lethargic in making big adjustments, and maybe they're just not comfortable with making those adjustments in Brazil. You know, you talk to private uh, folks down there, and they're 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 down around that 126 to 128 level. Some of them are, and so I think this Brazilian crop has certainly been hurt here in the first crop in some areas. Now, other areas obviously are going to be doing well. We know how that is uh, here in the U.S. We saw extremely good soybean yields for the early beans that were planted that were able to get past a uh, critical stage before you got into that dry period in August, whereas some of the later planted beans, as we saw in the November report, uh, certainly took a hit because you had that huge yield drop between October and November. So I think that you could see some real wide disparities in Brazil as well. Uh, the, lot's going to be, we're going to learn a lot as we move forward, but I, I think Conab probably had a little bigger impact. Naomi, you've uh, sent out a lot of charts this week, and uh, there's a couple of them that got my attention. And one of them that you said, you, you talked about the lowest estimate that we've got uh, in seven years. Does that concern you? As far as ending stocks Yeah, I'm go, sorry. I'm sorry on ending stocks, yes. Yeah. So um, where we're at right now for ending stocks, and more specifically the stocks-to-use ratio, we're at 3.9% on a stocks-to-use ratio, obviously lower than last month. Second lowest in the past 20 years. So that is significant. So what is remaining of the crop, um, the, the stocks to use ratio, it really does matter. And so that is going to keep the market well supported going forward until we have any idea that potentially we do have multiple additional acres planted next spring and a bountiful crop coming. But until then, it's gonna keep basis probably tighter on soybeans and also keep those front month contracts supported overall. So it's very important to watch that and monitor it um, but again, as of this moment, we don't have specific news to get the bean price over $12, but at the bigger time too, great support at the 1150 area and then ultimately below there at $11.
Well, you just took part of my answer from this following question, but I want to give this one. Uh, came via Twitter. Bradley in Nebraska was asking this over there in the Upland area. He says, following Thursday's report for USDA, would it be wise to start marketing some of 2021's corn and soybean crops? So, Naomi, you just gave me some prices. Um, you think it's wise to market some soybeans right now? For next November, for yeah. new crop? Let's say new crop. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. New crop is um, at the 1050, um, 1025 price area. It's been trading in a sideways range. It's better than anything you probably started at this year. So it would be a good place to get started for next year. Absolutely. A 5% sale, 10% sale, I think is a prudent thing to do. Matt, any wow. wider sale, Mark, right now? More than 10%, 11%? Are you with her, with Naomi on that? New crop? Yeah, actually, uh, you know, officially I'm at 20%. And where, where, but what I what I've done here is I set a floor into the market. So you know, set a floor into the market, and then uh, you know maybe sell a call above the market of a dollar, dollar twenty above the market. So I have a little bit of room to run, a little bit of flexibility in that strategy. Obviously, I'm capped out. But I'm only capped out on maybe 20%. And so I do like setting a floor into these prices. Like Naomi said, uh, these are really good prices compared to what we've seen the last several years. You look at the yields we saw this past year in the last couple, three years. Uh, if you have an average crop and you're, and you're cashing in anywhere close to $10 on your cash price out of the field, uh, that's a heck of a good winner. And I, and I, I want to lock in as much of that as what I can. All right, Naomi. Uh Right about an hour before we recorded, uh, Tom Vilsack was reintroduced at, or introduced as a chance to be Secretary of Agriculture again. Uh, still has to go through the confirmation practice uh, process. Sonny Perdue has led a USDA effort for a big food buying program, the box program. Dairy was a big part of that. That ran us up tremendously uh, over the last few months. Fell off a little bit, but now we're starting to see some light at the end of the tunnel. What is that light? Well, I'm wondering if the market is excited about Tom Vilsack because of what he's been doing with the dairy exports right now. And so he is familiar with the industry. The dairy market, as you know, we had $24 milk this summer because of the cheese buying program. And then with the cheese buying program and the farm to family program coming to an end at the end of 2020, the milk price plummeted. December contract going down to the $15 area. But meanwhile, when you look out at the 20 21 prices, they had just been patiently sitting at the $16 level because they know that milk production right now is still really near record large. So we have a lot of milk out there and we need the demand of the farm to families program. So Mr. Vilsack, if you're watching, please make sure it continues. It is really good for not only the American dairy farmer, but of course for just America as well as a lot of people are still out of work. And so I'm wondering if those deferred contracts are thinking that we're gonna see the cheese buying continue. And that's why actually they started to move a little bit higher this week with even the March contract today getting up to $18. Matt, the word in the live cattle market is volatile again. Uh, it's hit at the other market, so why not live cattle market? Do you see how long does this volatility last? Well, you know, the interesting thing is we're still range bound. You know, you look at this like 110 to 116 area in February's. And I mean, basically, we, we can't break out of that. Uh, you see box beef prices off a little bit, but then cash prices are off a little bit. Margins are still good. So packer margins are good. What are they going to do? They're going to they're going to go through as many cattle as what they possibly can. And it's a good thing because there's plenty of supply out there. I'm still the same way that I've been for a long time, though. I guess I can't get super friendly to price until I get out past maybe the second quarter. I think whenever you start to see the numbers uh, a little more favorable, in my opinion, you can look at a little bit higher uh, beef cattle. Uh, I think fats probably in that 115 to 120 range later in the year is very, very believable. Uh, but before that, I just, I just don't see it. All right. In the feeder market, Naomi, uh, there's a little bit of spillover what's going on in live cattle, but you also have that feed input cost that's really been uh, a concern for those on the on the balance sheet. Is that going to be the big weight around the neck of the uh, the feeder right now? Well, that's a great point. And so in southwest Wisconsin, there's a sale barn this week that had uh, 650 to 700 pound feeders going for like 148 to 150. Not cheap, but the demand is there. And so people are buying these feeders. And, and if you do the math on the feed costs and assuming you can lock in feed prices where they are right now, you need for a break even come June or August, you need uh, 114, 115. And so 
the market needs to deliver on that in order for those feeders to be profitable. Um, I have a friendly view for live cattle prices heading out into second and third quarter, similar to what Matt was saying. I'm keeping an eye on the July, I'm sorry, excuse me, on the June contract. I think that there's some technical momentum building there. And with the production expected to be lower because of that low placement, those deferred contracts have a lot of fundamental stability and support. And also keeping an eye on as dry as it is in the plains out west and the drought that continues to grow there. I think the cattle story still is a story that has got some bullish momentum to it in the deferred contracts. All right, Matt, I'm sorry to the hog market. 15 seconds because I want to talk about uh, expansion in the market when it comes to China. But in, in 15 seconds, where are we headed on, on hogs? I have a hard time getting friendly in the hog market if you're going to give me 15 seconds. I just can't do it. I think, especially when you're talking about expansion, you know, I don't think China's the only place that uh, wants to expand yeah. on pork production. And so it's, it's tough for me to get friendly. I apologize for the shortness. We will get more of it in Market Plus. That's Naomi Bloom. That's Matthew Bennett. Thank you so much to the two of you. Appreciate your time. Thank you. That will do it for this installment of Market to Market, but we will talk more in Market Plus, so join us there. You can find it on our website at markettomarket.org. You helped push us past a threshold of support on our YouTube channel. Thank you so very much for joining our club. There's still time to join us, as the benefits include knowing when we've posted new videos of the program. Also, the same with Market Plus and stories that you have seen on air. Search Market to Market and click subscribe today. Next week, we'll look at a Christmas tree farmer, how they're battling the drought. We'll see you next week. Market to Market is a production of Iowa PBS, which is solely responsible for its content. What's the most complex industry on earth? It's not genetics, or meteorology, or logistics. It's a business that involves them all. It's farming. Thank you, farmers, from Pioneer. Tomorrow, for over 100 years, we've worked to help our customers be ready for tomorrow. Trust in tomorrow. Information is available from a Grinnell Mutual agent today.